A teenage girl takes matters into her own hands this Memorial Day weekend. A big mama bear appears ready to pounce at several dogs. The teen then shoves the bear off the wall and successfully keeps her dogs out of harm's way. I didn't know I had it in me, to be honest. Like, who does that? Who in their right mind pushes a bear? Tonight, the nation marks the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. More than 300 black people murdered by a white mob. An entire community known as Black Wall Street burned to the ground. The president on the ground tonight in Tulsa for the solemn milestone. And what lesson has the country learned 100 years later? And the breaking news tonight, the latest major cyber attack, this time hitting one of America's largest meat producers. What you need to know and who may be responsible. Hackers for Hire, Russia's best hackers coming together for this hacking convention. Can they help prevent the next major cyber attack? But are some of the people here out to hurt us? The chilling new surveillance video of a deadly mass shooting in Miami. Police say the video shows three gunmen killing two people and wounding nearly two dozen more in less than 10 seconds. The manhunt tonight for those responsible. To kick off Pride Month, we are joined by a trailblazer, the first transgender official confirmed by the Senate. Our conversation with Dr. Rachel Levine on the outlook for the pandemic here in the U.S. and her experience as a high-profile transgender official. I'm going to dedicate myself to my public health mission, and that is the same as transgender individuals across the country doing good work throughout our nation. And literally putting Zimbabwe on the map. The man dreaming big tonight to bring the African nation's map into the 21st century, one road and highway at a time. A map is never final. People are constantly adding more context, more perspectives, more adding more voices towards the representation of these places. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Just because history is silent, it doesn't mean it did not take place. And while darkness can hide much, it erases nothing. Those were the words of President Biden today in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to mark 100 years since the Tulsa massacre. It's a moment in history that many are now saying has been overlooked, ignored, and dismissed for too long. On June 1st, 1921, a mob of white people murdered 300 black Americans and destroyed thousands of homes and businesses. Today, Biden became the first sitting president to visit the site of the massacre and see 100 years later what endures and what was wiped out completely. The president met with survivors of the massacre, all children then and now more than 100 years old. He also outlined his plan to narrow the racial wealth gap in America and reduce racial discrimination in housing, saying the dream of justice for all will be deferred no longer. Our Marcus Moore leads us off tonight from Tulsa. Tonight, acknowledging a tragedy long overlooked in American history. President Biden traveling to Oklahoma to honor the lives lost and forever changed by the Tulsa race massacre, the first president in 100 years to do so. For much too long, the history of what took place here was told in silence, cloaked in darkness. But just because history is silent, it doesn't mean that it did not take place. Starting the night of May 31st, 1921, an angry white mob stormed through Tulsa's Greenwood neighborhood, also known as Black Wall Street. In less than 24 hours, more than 1,000 homes and businesses were destroyed, an estimated 300 black Americans killed, all after allegations that were never proven that a black man assaulted a white woman in an elevator. Today, what no president has ever done, standing in Tulsa, putting words to the horror of what happened. 100 years ago, at this hour, on this first day of June, smoke darkened the Tulsa sky, rising from 35 blocks of Greenwood that were left in ash and ember, raised in rubble. Through the night and into the morning, the mob terrorized Greenwood, torches and guns, shooting at will. A mob tied a black man by the waist to the back of their truck with his head banging along the pavement as they drove off. A murdered black family draped over the fence of their home outside. An elderly couple knelt by their bed praying to God with their heart and their soul when they were shot in the back of their heads. The president today proposing policies to begin to level the playing field on housing, education, and investing in small businesses, including those run by black and brown entrepreneurs. The only way to build 
A common ground is to truly repair and to rebuild. Today's visit coming after days of events marking the 100th anniversary of the 1921 massacre and continued calls for remembrance and resolve. I'm here seeking justice and I'm asking my country to acknowledge what happened in Tulsa in 1921. Just weeks ago, three survivors delivering emotional testimony before Congress. We lost everything that day, our homes, our churches, our newspapers, our theaters, our lives. Greenwood represented all the best of what was possible for black people in America and for all, for all the people. No one was ever held accountable for the attack. While hundreds are believed to have been killed, only 36 people were officially confirmed dead. Today, the city of Tulsa resumed the search for mass graves in Oakland Cemetery. In October, at least a dozen missing bodies were discovered here. Many believe locating and identifying the victims is long overdue. Many believe a lot of the aspects of this massacre are overdue. Marcus Moore joins us now from Tulsa. Uh, Marcus, after decades of this massacre being absent from the history books, what are you hearing from Tulsa's residents as far as what this moment of recognition, including a visit from the president today, means for their community? Well, Lindsay, it, it means a lot because what we have heard from people throughout the weekend, uh, including today, is that um, just the mere acknowledgement that this happened, that it happened here in Tulsa and that so many lives were lost. And then in the midst of this massacre, there were families whose uh, generational wealth was, was erased. Uh, for there to be acknowledgement of that and accepting the fact that it did happen uh, will go a long way um, towards beginning the process uh, of trying to heal but it certainly uh, then lends itself to the question of what do you do uh, to restore uh, what was taken away from so many families here. And then also today, President Biden met with each of the three known remaining survivors from 1921. Yeah, he did, and the, the survivors, they range in age from 101 to 107, and the president said they uh, spoke to him about the massacre itself, how in one night, everything, absolutely everything changed uh, for them. There were thousands of people left destitute and homeless, and then uh, they were forced into internment camps and told not to speak about it. But the president said today that uh, only in remembrance do wounds heal. And this is a wound that has been open, Lindsay, as you know, for a long time. Marcus Moore reporting in for us from Tulsa. Thanks so much, Marcus. For more on the president's visit to Tulsa, we're joined now by Dr. Robert Turner, pastor at the Mount Vernon AME Church, one of the few original black-owned structures on Black Wall Street in Greenwood that survived the 1921 massacre. Dr. Turner, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. All eyes, of course, are on Tulsa right now. What do you hope comes out of this moment? I hope, I hope that what comes out of this moment is that America sees that we have still a place that has never been investigated, the largest uninvestigated crime scene in America. And I hope that justice comes for the survivors and the descendants. And I hope that we actually truly live up to the true meaning of our creed. And what's the one thing that you want people to understand about the 1921 race massacre as we reach this 100-year mark? That it was a state-sanctioned act of terrorism uh, against America's own citizens who happened to be black. It was the first time that bombs were dropped on American soil um, for people on people because of the color of their skin and because they were successful. And that before there was any governmental programs, we had black excellence and achievement here in Greenwood, and it was assaulted. Uh, by a racist white mob that was deputized by the police department. You've joined Greenwood residents for years in calling for reparations for the descendants of the victims of 1921. What do you believe is owed to the descendants of the Tulsa massacre? I believe they deserve reparations. I believe they deserve an investigation. I believe they deserve the truth to finally be told. And I believe they deserve for their taxpayers, for their taxes to finally work for them. Do you see that day coming? Do you think that that's going to become a reality? I I, I protest every week for that cause, and I pray in my heart, and I believe that it will happen one day soon. Uh, President Biden uh, obviously addressed uh, the, the crowd there. What would you like to see coming out of the Biden administration? I would like to see some legislation as it relates to reparations. I would like to see H.R. 40 passed. I would like to see some anti-black uh, hate 
uh, legislation passed. I would like to see uh, the George Floyd police reform bill passed. I would like to see these voter suppression laws across the country that are being passed for them to be uh, rejected and for there to be some voter laws that encourage people to vote and not discourage people to vote. Dr. Robert Turner, pastor at the Mount Vernon AME Church in Tulsa, we thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Next, a major supplier of beef and pork here in the U.S. is the latest victim of a ransomware cyber attack. And the company says a criminal organization likely based in Russia is behind it. Production has shut down at several processing facilities, potentially affecting beef and pork at your local supermarkets. Here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Tonight, American consumers facing yet another cyber attack that could potentially impact everyday life. JBS, the country's largest meat producer, shutting down at least four plants here in the U.S. and others in Canada and Australia. Thousands of workers impacted. JBS calling it a ransomware attack on the company's computer servers with origins in Russia. I don't think we've seen uh, a period of this kind of uh, sort of high-intensity cyber operations from Russian soil directed against a variety of different U.S. targets, arguably ever. The attack comes on the heels of the Colonial Pipeline hack, which led the company to shut down the fuel line, causing thousands of gas stations in the southeast to close. And solar winds, which impacted scores of federal agencies and Fortune 500 companies. With the president expected to meet Putin in the coming weeks, the White House acknowledging today hacking looms as a major issue. The White House is engaging directly with the Russian government on this matter and delivering the message that responsible states do not harbor ransomware criminals. It's unclear exactly how much money the hackers are requesting from JBS or whether the company will pay millions like Colonial Pipeline did. Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, are, are the pace of these types of cyber and ransomware attacks picking up or are they just being revealed more publicly at this point? Lizzie, there's every indication that there's been an extraordinary rise in cyber attacks, specifically these ransomware attacks, where the hackers are demanding money from companies. And officials are very concerned that this spike is going to lead to more instability, and law enforcement officials are stepping up their efforts to try to target the people doing these kinds of attacks. And, and what kind of impact could this ransomware attack on JBS, for example, have on the supply of meat products and prices across the U.S.? Well, our business team spoke with some experts today, and they said it all depends on the length. How much time will these four plants inside the United States be shut down? They're shut down currently. That will determine if prices go up and whether there are any shortages, Lindsay. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. Our team in Moscow for weeks has been closely tracking this growing cyber threat from Russia and learning more about the players. What we found is not only an underground threat, but one very much in the open. Alleged bad actors working alongside hackers who say that they are working to protect companies and countries, and that has U.S. officials very concerned. Patrick Revel has this report. What you're looking at is a conference full of hackers. The biggest event of its kind in Russia. Thousands packed in a hall in downtown Moscow. It looks a lot like any other conference. Keynote speakers, technology displays. And it's here where Russia's top cyber talent are honing their skills, attacking and defending this made-up city, gaming out how to fend off the next big cyber attack. I'd say we are one of the best in the world when it comes to IT. In the last month, the type of cyber attacks simulated here have become all too real for many people. A spate of spectacular ransomware attacks occurring around the world. One of the nation's biggest fuel pipelines forced to shut down after a cyber attack. Last month, the crippling attack on the Colonial Pipeline in the United States that carries 40% of the East Coast's gas supply. Then, another ransomware attack, leaving Ireland's health system largely without computers for weeks. The ransomware used in both attacks is linked to criminal gangs in Russia, the country and hacking once again back in the spotlight. But the hacker conference in Moscow is for companies and experts to learn how to guard against attacks just like the one on the U.S. pipeline. It's like boxing, right? So you start boxing with somebody and you may fail, but then you get more experience. Every time you have opponent which is stronger, more stronger and more stronger, and probably at the end of the day you fight with a champion, world champion. But the cyber world is complicated. 
Last month, the Biden administration sanctioned the conference's organizer, Positive Technologies, as part of measures to punish Russia, including for cyber attacks by its intelligence services. The U.S. accused the company of supporting Russian intelligence and alleged this conference is a recruiting ground for Russian cyber spies. So going through this logic, we should uh, close all conferences all over the world. This story is more in like political and geopolitical things. What we know is that we are open company, we fully transparent, we help to many vendors and to many companies to improve security in their products. Positive Technologies is one of Russia's biggest private cybersecurity firms. They work with many major international companies. It denies it provides any offensive tools to Russia's government. We do have defensive products like web application firewall, which may help you to protect the website. And from this perspective, either FSB or Ministry of Defense or Ministry of Interior, like a police, uh, can be our customers and they are our customers buying defensive technologies. So far, the U.S. imposed sanctions against Russia seem not to have deterred the Kremlin. Just last week, Microsoft saying Russian state hackers hijacked the email system of U.S. aid, a government agency. The Kremlin denying allegations that they were involved. Cybersecurity expected to be one of the top concerns for Biden when he and Putin have their first summit later this month. Hello, my friends. My name is Sergei Pavlovich, and this is my channel, Mother Russia. Sergei Pavlovich was a cyber criminal. He now hosts a popular YouTube show in Russia, sometimes also dubbed in English, where he talks about Russian cybercrime and how people can protect themselves from it. We have uh, um, a good saying here: uh, if you if you don't steal uh, in Russia, uh, you have no problems. In 2008, the Justice Department indicted Pavlovich as part of an alleged hacking ring that stole 40 million payment card numbers. He was jailed in his native Belarus for 10 years. America sent uh, here papers about our crime, but police and uh, FSB and uh, so on law enforcement agencies uh, don't want to um, investigate uh, our crime here because we don't steal from our people and uh, this is not their problems, this is American problems. Ransomware is now very often rented as a service, meaning those behind the attacks could be anywhere. The most sophisticated ransomware is a Russian origin, is made in Russia. But who use it exactly, we don't know. Uh, tom uh, today I can rent it, uh, tomorrow you can rent it. Experts say there's little appetite from the Kremlin to prosecute cybercrime. Or that for now, US sanctions are doing much to deter attacks from Russian intelligence. It means that more attacks are likely only a matter of time. Patrick Revel for ABC News. Some ominous reporting there are thanks to Patrick. And now to COVID-19 in this country after Memorial Day weekend that felt for most somewhat close to normal. Tonight, Moderna is joining Pfizer and applying to the FDA for full approval of its vaccine for adults, a move that could help encourage more Americans to get vaccinated. Also tonight, a new variant is emerging. Will the vaccines work against it? Here's ABC's Eva Pilgrim. Tonight, in a major move that could boost vaccine confidence, Moderna becoming the second vaccine maker after Pfizer to formally ask the FDA for full approval of its vaccine. A new poll says about a third of unvaccinated adults would be more likely to get a shot if the vaccine was fully FDA approved. Over the weekend, a massive push to get more shots into arms. I was not gonna get it, but since it was uh, close to my home, I decided to come out. The Memorial Day weekend launching the country on its comeback from the coronavirus. It feels great. It just really, it's just the whole human contact and being able to be around people. Air travel shattering pandemic records, crowds turning out at parades, parks, and beaches. Once the epicenter of the virus, New York City reporting no COVID deaths today and its lowest positivity rate ever. Vaccinations equal freedom. It's as simple as that. But around 450 COVID deaths on average are still reported every day, more than the number of Americans lost to stroke daily. And experts fear states with the lowest vaccination rates 
could see an uptick in cases. Last year, right around this time, we saw a big surge in cases uh, in the South. This year, the problem is there's still a lot of people unvaccinated in many of the southern states. Uh, so that's what we got to work on. And tonight, experts are tracking a new variant detected in Vietnam where cases are on the rise. The World Health Organization says the variant, now called Delta, is virtually identical to that highly contagious variant from India. Eva Pilgrim joins us now. And Eva, there are concerns about that variant found in Vietnam, but there's also new research showing the effectiveness of the vaccines against that variant from India. That's right, Lindsay. So there's a new study out of the UK that found that the Pfizer vaccine works really well against this new highly contagious Indian variant. But scientists are flagging that without the second dose, there was a noticeable dip in protection. The data really affirming how important it is that people get both doses, Lindsay. And we can now report that 11 states have met Biden's Independence Day goal of 70 percent of adults who've gotten at least one shot. Exactly, Lindsay. 11 states, and that's just looking at the adult population. Washington state is very closely ticking towards that number as well. But another thing to keep in mind as we look at these numbers, there are a handful of states, a lot of them in the south, that are nowhere near that 70 percent threshold. So there is quite a bit of work left to be done. Many more vaccines into arms to meet President Biden's goal. Lindsay. Eva Pilgrim, thanks so much. And for more on the encouraging news on the COVID front and what happens next, we are joined by Dr. Rachel Levine. She's also a trailblazer and happens to be the first openly transgender federal official to be confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Dr. Levine, we appreciate you making the time to speak with us on this, the first day of Pride Month. More on that in just a moment. But let's start out with COVID in America. As we've been reporting, the country is opening up. Many are feeling relieved about that. But how concerned are you about the virus variants like the one just discovered in Vietnam? Well, we are making significant progress in our battle against COVID-19. Um, as you were saying, the number of, of new patients is going down, the number of hospitalizations, and the number of, of deaths. And with our safe and effective vaccines, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but we're not there yet. And we can't let our guard down, and we have to continue to dedicate ourselves to vaccinating hard-to-reach people. And we heard today that Moderna is seeking full authorization. How soon do you think that that full approval could come? Uh, it, it depends, you know, upon the approval process uh, through the FDA and then consideration by the CDC. Uh, but, but we would expect that this month. And what about specifically for children under the age of 12 with so many parents eager to get their young children vaccinated? Well, we don't have a timeline for the childhood vaccines. That depends upon the science uh, and the clinical trials that are ongoing. And so we will await the, the results of the, uh, of the science and when those clinical trials are complete. And let's turn to the LGBTQ rights. Your department, HHS, made an announcement this month that it will enforce Title IX and also a section of the Affordable Care Act that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity and health programs and activities. Walk us through what this change looks like. Well, this is a, a very important change uh, because, of course, this, the size and scope of the Affordable Care Act is very significant in, in uh, health care. Um, so this is a, uh, an interpretation of uh, the ACA and Section 1557, uh, that when the ACA refers to sex and uh, not discriminating according to sex in all of its different programs, that that includes as you mentioned, sexual orientation and gender identity. And we'll be working throughout HHS to implement those plans. What's your take on states trying to restrict transgender athletes from playing sports at high school and college levels? I think that they're very challenging and unfortunate. You know, I think that trans youth are very vulnerable. They have often faced significant bullying and harassment, and, and they need our, our support. They need to be nurtured, not to be limited from their activities such as sports. Before HHS, you were Pennsylvania's Secretary of Health, leading that state's pandemic response. You certainly won a lot of praise in that role, but there were also some ugly incidents like bigoted statements or that Bloomsburg Fair where there was a dunk tank appearing to mock you. You reportedly said in 2016 that with few exceptions, being transgender has not been an issue. Do you feel that that changed at all as your role became more public? 
Well, you know, I am uh, laser focused on my public health mission. Uh, and that was true at the Pennsylvania Department of Health and now true as the Assistant Secretary for Health at HHS. And that includes, of course, COVID-19, uh, the increasing number of overdose deaths that we're seeing, uh, health equity, and many other programs that we need to, to work on and achieve in public health. That's what I'm focused on. But this is Pride Month, as you said, and I think that it is very important to advocate uh, for, uh, for equality uh, and health equity for the LGBT TQ community. And lastly, kind of piggybacking off of that, what do you feel are potentially the most harmful misconceptions about transgender people, particularly in your field of public health? Well, transgender individuals such as myself are really just like everybody else. And so uh, th that is why uh, I was, am so grateful to President Biden uh, that he nominated me to this position and so grateful to the Senate for approving me with a bipartisan vote. And now I'm going to dedicate myself to my public health mission. And that is the same as transgender individuals across the country doing good work throughout our nation. Dr. Rachel Levine, Assistant Secretary for Health at the HHS, we thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you. Next to the voting rights showdown in Texas, Governor Greg Abbott is vowing to call a legislative special session after Democrats walked out late Sunday night, blocking passage of a Republican-led bill that would restrict voting access. One Democrat texting others, take your keys and leave the building discreetly to pull off the walkout this weekend. So what happens next? Here's ABC's Rachel Scott. Tonight, Texas Governor Greg Abbott threatening Democratic lawmakers after they staged this walkout, blocking one of the most restrictive voting bills in the country. The governor vowing to withhold the salaries of legislators and their staff, tweeting, no pay for those who abandon their responsibilities. The fact that the governor is saying that he would uh, close down the paychecks of those who serve in the House of Representatives uh, shows you how low he's willing to go to wield his power. Abbott is also now preparing to call a special session to address a Republican back push for, quote, election integrity, potentially including parts of that bill Democrats opposed, which bans drive through voting, restricts mail in ballots, adding a new ID requirement and pushes back early voting hours on Sunday when many black churchgoers head to the polls. The bill also makes it easier for a judge to overturn an election if there are allegations of fraud. But there was no evidence of widespread voter fraud in the 2020 election. Later today, speaking in Tulsa, Biden ramping up the pressure on Congress. Earlier this year, the House of Representatives passed for the People Act to protect our democracy. The Senate will take it up later this month, and I'm going to fight like heck with every tool at my disposal for its passage. President Biden vowing to fight. Rachel Scott joins us now. Rachel, we heard that lawmaker in Texas calling on Congress and the White House to act. So where do efforts at the federal level stand on protecting voting access? Well, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer Lindsay said he's going to bring voting rights legislation to the floor for a vote in just a matter of weeks in June. But the reality here is that this still faces a significant uphill challenge. The president today said that Vice President Kamala Harris is now going to be in charge with getting this legislation through Congress. But Democrats will first need to get on the same page, and then they're going to need to get Republicans on board, too. They're going to need the support of at least 10 Republicans in the Senate in order to get this passed. That is a significant challenge, Lindsay. And what happens next in Texas? When could this come up for vote again? It could come up as early as this week. I did talk to a Texas state Democrat today that actually walked out of the chamber just days ago. They said they were waiting for this uh, to come down any minute now. But she also noted the wave in voting restrictive bills that we are seeing sweep across the country. At the start of this year, 400, according to the Brennan Center for Justice. And then now you have 14 states that have already enacted laws further restricting voting access. Lindsay? Rachel Scott reporting in from the Capitol tonight. Thanks so much, Rachel. And when we come back, the deadly shooting at a fire station and why California investigators believe it may be connected to a separate incident where a body was found in a pool. The basketball fan facing charges tonight after a week of several disturbing incidents involving fans at NBA games. But up next, the chilling surveillance video and the warnings of a potential long, hot and bloody summer. 
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. It was Gone Girl. Oh my God, the Hollywood story come true. She was kidnapped, held captive. I thought it was the end of my life. He was tied up, left to think the love of his life was dead. I was afraid that was going to be like the last time I was going to see her. And just when you thought this true crime couldn't get any more shocking. All of a sudden, boom, this is insane. Now, the stunning all-new interview. All I wanted was to hug my mom and dad. Finally feel safe. 2020, Friday night on ABC. Now to that manhunt in Miami after the deadly mass shooting outside a banquet hall. The three suspects seen arriving with assault-style weapons returning and driving off within 10 seconds. More than 100 shell casings found at the scene. That vehicle later found in a canal. Our Victor Akendo reports on the new surveillance video and a warning some viewers may find it hard to watch. The new video obtained by our station WPLG shows a crowd outside El Mula Banquet Hall run for cover the moment three suspects open fire. Another angle released Monday showing three men jump out of a white Nissan Pathfinder armed with assault-style weapons taking off just 10 seconds later. Hours after releasing that video, police finding the SUV dumped in a canal. Police looking at those videos as they hunt for the men now on the run for killing two and wounding 20 at a local rapper's record release party late Saturday night. Among the two dead, 26-year-old Clayton Dillard III. Authorities saying the shooting appears to be targeted. It was a bloody Memorial Day weekend across South Florida and in cities across the country. In Philadelphia, 16 people were shot, four killed between Friday and Monday. And in New York City, in just a six-hour span Monday, there was at least one shooting in every borough, 12 shot, a 15-year-old killed. Gun violence is an epidemic, and the pandemic has intensified it. Lindsay, we're right outside the venue where this happened. You can see the growing memorial. The front door is littered with bullet holes. Miami-Dade's mayor is asking for the public's help here. She says the tips have been coming in. They're offering a large reward for any information leading to an arrest, $130,000. Lindsay? Victor, our thanks to you. Still ahead here on Prime, the medical breakthrough that could offer hope to some people with lung cancer. The man who couldn't find the African town that he came from on Google Maps, he decided to plot out his entire nation. And it's the start of Pride Month. We take a look by the numbers. And speaking of Pride Month, our tweet of the day, courtesy of our friends at Sesame Street, marking the start of the month. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. 
I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back, everyone. And now we turn to Pride Month, when the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community comes together for a month-long celebration of love, diversity, acceptance, and, of course, pride. We take a look by the numbers. June 28, 1969, that's when police raided the Stonewall in a gay bar in New York City, which sparked an uprising that helped launch the modern fight for LGBTQ rights. June was chosen as Pride Month to commemorate this event. 1978, that's when the iconic rainbow flag was created by Gilbert Baker. The six colors on the flag each have a distinct meaning. Red for life, orange for healing, yellow for sunlight, green for nature, blue for harmony, and violet for spirit. We're, of course, skipping a lot of history here, but June 26, 2015, that's when the Supreme Court guaranteed same-sex couples the right to marry across the country. When the case was decided, 13 states did not allow same-sex marriages, but more than 290,000 same-sex couples married in the five years after that SCOTUS ruling. Today, 5.6% of all U.S. adults identify as LGBTQ, according to Gallup. But among Gen Zs, the youngest adults, 15.9%, that's nearly one in six, say that they are LGBTQ. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The fallout from the personal battle that led to Naomi Osaka, ranked number two in the world in tennis, to drop out of the French Open. And the sky pool, but you have to be rather brave to get in. And you have no doubt heard about the supercharged housing market, but did you know some cities are now offering money for you to move there? First, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big hug, we tell all our patients how much they are loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. Oh! 
It was Gone Girl. Oh my God, the Hollywood story come true. She was kidnapped, held captive. I thought it was the end of my life. He was tied up, left to think the love of his life was dead. I was afraid that was going to be like the last time I was going to see her. And just when you thought this true crime couldn't get any more shocking. All of a sudden, boom, this is insane. Now, the stunning all-new interview. All I wanted was to hug my mom and dad. Finally feel safe. 2020, Friday night on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America. In the afternoon, it's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. President Biden in Tulsa, where he met with the three survivors of the Greenwood community who lived through the Tulsa race massacre. They're now between the ages of 101 and 107. An estimated 300 residents of Blackwall Street died or lost everything a century ago when an angry white mob set the thriving black community on fire. For much too long, the history of what took place here was told in silence cloaked in darkness. But just because history is silent, it doesn't mean that it did not take place. And while darkness can hide much, it erases nothing. No one was ever punished or held accountable for the massacre. There's currently a lawsuit against the city of Tulsa and others for the estimated $1.8 million in property loss claims from back then. My fellow Americans, this was not a riot. This was a massacre. Tennis superstar Naomi Osaka says she's taking a break from the sport. 23-year-old superstar tweeting, I think now the best thing for the tournament, the other players, and my well-being is that I withdraw. I never wanted to be a distraction. It's unclear when she will return to the court. Osaka withdrew from the French Open one day after she was fined $15,000 for skipping her post-match press conference. Osaka says she's battled long bouts of depression and anxiety since springing into stardom in 2018 when she beat Serena Williams at the U.S. Open, standing emotional under a towel as Williams fans booed her win. Williams speaking out Monday, supporting Osaka. I feel for Naomi because I know what it's like. You just have to let her handle it the way she wants to. Karen Millick looks forward to spending one month of every summer with her grandson, Giles. He's the apple of my eye. But in the summer of 2019, she received devastating news about her health. The lung cancer she'd been fighting had spread. In 2019, after nearly 40 years of research, a clinical drug trial for a pill called Lumacris started showing benefits as a potential treatment. With few options left, Karen enrolled in the drug trial at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center with Dr. Bob Lee. And within months, her stage four cancer was disappearing and it's been remarkable. The tumor has essentially melted away. It's, it's not even visible on the uh, CT scan. Last Friday, the medicine used in the trial was FDA approved. Lumacris, a pill developed by Amgen, will now be available to help treat cancers previously thought untreatable. 
As Americans return to arenas, the number of sports fans acting badly is growing. Last night, a fan was arrested after running onto the court during a Washington Wizards game. Since fans returned to arenas at the beginning of the playoffs, we've seen a fan spit on Atlanta Hawks star Trey Young at Madison Square Garden and popcorn dumped on Russell Westbrook's head. And Memphis Grizzly star Ja Morant says his family may not attend their next road game after the team indefinitely banned three fans accused of directing racist and insensitive remarks towards Morant's family at the last game in Utah. A Celtics fan accused of throwing a water bottle at Kyrie Irving at Sunday night's game facing assault and battery charges will be arraigned tomorrow. Feeling brave? The new London Sky Pool is now open. The world's first transparent pool, made in Colorado, stretches between two high-rise apartment buildings in London. Swimmers have views of Parliament and the London Eye. You can also see through the bottom to the ground, 115 feet below. Welcome back, everyone. Southern California officials are now trying to figure out what may have led an L.A. Fire Department employee to open fire in yet another case of workplace violence. Kaylee Hartung has more. Tonight, a firefighter is dead after allegedly being shot by one of his own. The latest workplace shooting coming to a fiery end in Southern California. All stations, we have an active shooter situation at Fire Station 81. Authorities say an off-duty L.A. County firefighter shot and killed a 44-year-old firefighter and critically wounded a fire captain. He was a brave, committed, loyal member of the fire department for over 20 years. A victim flown to the hospital. Firefighter with multiple gunshot wounds trying to get him into the hospital and get him the care he needs immediately. And just 10 miles away from the shooting at the station, this massive house fire erupting. The home believed to be owned by the suspect. The suspect is saying he's going to shoot at anybody that approaches. Then the sheriff started arriving and they had their long weapons out. The SWAT team rappelling onto the scene from a helicopter. Officials letting the fire burn, concerned the gunman could be barricaded inside. Choppers swooping in from above, dropping water on the flames. Authorities finding the suspect dead in the backyard from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Kaylee Hartung joins us now from Los Angeles County. And Kayla, you've just heard from officials. What do they have to say? Well, Lindsay, the gunman wasn't scheduled to work today, but authorities say he went to his fire station and confronted his co-workers who were on duty. Authorities aren't saying why. They don't know. They say they have a long list of people who they need to interview, and they have two crime scenes, including the fire department, which is just down this road behind me. We're being kept at a safe distance. They've got two crime scenes they need to process, so this will take time. And Lindsay, as you know, this is the second deadly workplace shooting in the state of California in less than a week. Lindsay. Kaylee Hartung, our thanks to you reporting on both of those. Now to cities across the country offering people thousands of dollars and other incentives to move and work there. ABC's Rebecca Jarvis has more on how it works and what you should know before you pack up your bags. When the pandemic hit, entrepreneur coach Bree Seely thought she would ride it out in her New York City apartment. After about... I four or five weeks of being stuck alone in my apartment, I decided that I needed to make some sort of shift. She wasn't sure exactly what that shift would be, but then a friend told her about Tulsa Remote, a program that pays you $10,000 to move to the city with a remote job and live there for a year. At that point, that the pandemic wasn't going away anytime soon, and so I just opened myself up to the opportunity of adventure. So Bree completed an application process was accepted and within months she packed her bags and moved to Tulsa. And it's not just Tulsa, Oklahoma. Many cities across the country are offering a variety of incentives to attract new residents. These remote workers are enormously valuable to the communities that they move to. They bring themselves and their jobs. They're bringing tax revenue, they're, they, they're going to buy a home, they're going to spend in the local economy, and all that money sort of trickles uh, through uh, the economy. The online marketplace, Make My Move, allows you to browse offers and apply for free. Right now, Morgantown, West Virginia, is offering an incentive package totaling $20,000, including $12,000 in cash. Bloomfield, Iowa, is offering a $10,000 tax credit to move there. 
And Topeka, Kansas will give you $10,000 towards a new home or $5,000 towards rent, plus $1,000 in free Jimmy John sandwiches. What we're finding is a monumental shift in how communities think about economic development. Before leaving New York City, Bree was sure she would end up moving back. But after living in Tulsa, she's starting to rethink it. Life has taken me other directions since then. I definitely feel like a different person than the woman that left New York 12 months ago. The $1,000 sandwich credit might just tip the scales for many. Our thanks to Rebecca for that. What would you do if you looked up your hometown on Google Street View and you couldn't find it? Google says it's collected more than 170 billion images from 10 million miles across the planet, but there are still many unmapped parts of the world. Tonight, you're going to meet a man who took matters into his own hands. With just one click, Google Street View can transport you to just about any location, all from the comfort of your couch. And yet there are still some places that remain largely inaccessible to the virtual traveler. It's generally accepted that um, coverage usually begins from the United States and Western Europe of some of these products, and then it gradually spreads across the rest of the world. And the pace at which that happens can be really slow. We are becoming increasingly dependent on location and navigation tools from everyday service delivery to public health and safety, more so over the last couple of years. Enter Tawanda Kanhima. When the native of Zimbabwe tried to find his hometown Harare on Google Street View, the on-the-ground imagery wasn't there. I was having dinner with friends and my friend's dad asked me to show him my mom's house on the map. And, um, you know, we all have the habit of looking up our home the first thing we pick up a map and so for me that's something i had done before and i knew that i could not find my hometown on the map this was something that probably many people experience and um, i wanted to know what i could i could do about it Kanhima took action. He reached out to google they loaned him a 360 camera and off he went to zimbabwe I spoke to the team, told them about Zimbabwe and you know, 14 of the countries in the Southern Africa region that I thought would make an interesting place to represent on this platform. And so I borrowed a camera and went back home to Zimbabwe for the first time to do a pilot shoot where I just held the camera out of the window of my brother's car and we drove around the city and I came back. We had collected about 24 to 30 miles of footage. But he didn't stop there. A documentary crew teamed up with him and captured his journey of literally putting the street scenes across Zimbabwe on the map. I was able to go back to Zimbabwe and do a larger scale project that took two weeks and covered about 2,000 miles of highways and attractions. When I went back to Zimbabwe to do this mapping project, I was doing this alone. And a week after I got to Zimbabwe, Google sent a film team that was documenting the behind the scenes of this mapping project. They snapped panoramic views of Zimbabwe's cities and attractions via car, speedboat, bicycle, helicopter, and on foot. They were able to capture, you know, some of the solutions that I had come up with to mapping different locations, whether it was at Victoria Falls, flying over the waterfall in a helicopter and capturing 360 footage using a speedboat on the Zambezi River, which forms the Victoria Falls, or just cycling across the Victoria Falls Bridge. So some of those were ways to demonstrate how we could leverage this technology in unconventional places to really try and capture this imagery and improve the representation of those places. For Kanhima, it was about the opportunity to showcase all of the world. A map is never final. People are constantly adding more context, more perspectives, more adding more voices towards the representation of these places. And so for me, it feels like just a gentle, gradual improvement in the digital coverage of places in Africa. Making sure communities like his hometown in Zimbabwe are represented in the digital space. It felt empowering to be able to make that difference, to be able to make that connection and really make a difference in terms of the digital representation of my hometown and my country. 
it used to be that you look at a map and it is what it is. But as more people pick up these technologies, more people picking up these tools, maps become a confluence of perspectives. The most compelling thing for me is hearing from people who are using these images to help share a memory from you know, their lives. I hear from people who say, I was able to show my daughter the home in which I grew up. I was able to show my kids the hospital in which I was born. And um, just being able to hear that, that you, you know, people are using maps, not just for navigation and finding places. They're using maps to make a connection. They're using maps to tell stories. And that story is just a bit more complete, thanks to Kanhima. Some fascinating topography there. Our thanks to our friends at GoodMorningAmerica.com for bringing that story to us. And finally tonight, back in Tulsa, and a message tonight from the families 100 years after the burning of Black Wall Street. Our Steve Osinsami reports from Tulsa. When the memorials tonight come to an end in Tulsa, and when the last prayers are sent up this evening for the hundreds of black victims who were murdered here 100 years ago, the survivors and their families hope that America doesn't just move on. What is it you want me to not forget to tell America when we do this? That this is not just ancient history. Joy McCondici is the granddaughter of Eldoris McCondici, who survived the racist attack when she ran for her life and hid in a chicken coop. Airplanes above us, the bullets raining down all around us. All I could see was black rolling smoke down south and the people going north. Where the fires burned, they're now building a new $20 million history center. We're standing right where the entry doors will be. This will be the entry. This will be the entry. But Ms. Joy says that a new museum doesn't really help the next generation or help black businesses afford to stay in the neighborhood. She feels the young people here would have been better served by a new training center that would have given them the job skills to help build the new museum. You don't like the word reparations? No, sir. You prefer the word... Love offering. Love offering. Have a love offering. The families want America to know that none of this is over and that the healing starts with telling the truth. Until you tell the truth, until you're honest with your past, you can't go forward. And that's what we want all of America to know. We want you to come here, look at the past, look at this history, but be inspired to where we can go from here together. That's what we really want people to see and know. Our thanks to Steve Osinsami for that. And before we go tonight, the image of the day from the land of roses, literally, that's what this region in Turkey is called. It produces 60% of the world's harvest and exports the beautiful flowers around the globe. This woman was pictured picking some during the start of the harvest, which is expected to last all month long. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, staying on top of several things, America marking the 100th anniversary of one of the darkest moments in our nation's history, the Tulsa Race Massacre, buried in history no more. More on Biden's promise to bridge a wealth gap felt by generations. And the new bird flu strain and what we're learning about the human in China hospitalized by that virus. It was Gone Girl. Oh my God, the Hollywood story come true. She was kidnapped, held captive. I thought it was the end of my life. He was tied up, left to think the love of his life was dead. I was afraid that was going to be like the last time I was going to see her. And just when you thought this true crime couldn't get any more shocking. All of a sudden, boom, this is insane. Now, the stunning all-new interview. All I wanted was to hug my mom and dad. Finally feel safe. 2020, Friday night on ABC. powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. 
Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Welcome back. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The major pandemic milestone for the first time in a year, a holiday weekend, kind of felt like a holiday weekend for millions of Americans. People went to the movies, airports were packed, and we're now learning that nearly 60% of the population has received at least one dose of a vaccine in this country. This is Moderna has now joined Pfizer in applying for full FDA approval for its COVID vaccine for people 18 and older. Take a look at this chilling new surveillance video of the deadly mass shooting in Miami from over the weekend. You can see people running for cover the moment three suspects opened fire. Two people were killed and 20 wounded. In earlier video, police say you could see suspects jumping from an SUV and returning just 10 seconds later after opening fire. The manhunt continues for those suspects. America's longest war may be ending even faster than first thought. The Pentagon is now reporting that the withdrawal from Afghanistan is between 30 to 40 4% complete. The military has already shipped out some 300 C-17 cargo loads and handed over six facilities to the Afghan Ministry of Defense. President Biden had initially set September 11th as the deadline. And turning now to the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, President Biden was in Oklahoma this afternoon visiting the historic Greenwood District, once known as Black Wall Street. It was there in 1921, a violent mob of white men attacked the black residents who lived there, destroying their community and killing an estimated 300 black Americans in the process. ABC's Alex Perche has more. In 1921, a mob of armed white men burned down the community of Greenwood, a thriving hub of black-owned businesses in Tulsa, Oklahoma, nicknamed Black Wall Street. Untold amounts of generational wealth wiped out in just 24 hours. The ruthless attack left an estimated 300 black Americans dead, 10,000 displaced. President Biden today visiting the Greenwood Cultural Center and meeting with survivors of the massacre and other descendants, people like 106-year-old Mother Randall. It's just a big mess. The pain of that day is still fresh, and so is her pain for a lack of reckoning. No one was ever punished or held accountable for the massacre. There's currently a lawsuit against the city of Tulsa and others for the estimated $1.8 million in property loss claims from back then. Some injustices are so heinous, so horrific, so grievous, they can't be buried, no matter how hard people try. But there are calls to do more. The president says the attacks in Greenwood persisted across generations and that the federal government must recognize and acknowledge the role it has played in taking opportunities and wealth from black communities. This afternoon, he's unveiling steps that the federal government will take to boost contracting with small disadvantaged businesses by 50 percent. There is an interagency effort to address inequalities in housing appraisals. And as part of Biden's infrastructure plan, there's $10 billion for community revitalization projects to help places like Greenwood. My fellow Americans, 
This was not a riot. This was a massacre. Our thanks to Alex Prochet for that and for more on the Tulsa anniversary and to continue our coverage of Pride Month, we're joined now by ABC News contributor LZ Granderson. He just launched the ABC News podcast Life Out Loud with LZ Granderson, which he describes as a quote, a letter to the queer kid who thinks they're alone and also to everyone who needs a safe space or wants to learn about why having a space is important. Thanks as always for coming on the show, LZ. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, before we get to your podcast, let's discuss the legacy of the Tulsa massacre. A lawsuit was filed, as you know, against the city of Tulsa, and last week three of the survivors and their descendants gave emotional testimonies in Congress asking for acknowledgement and reparations. In our current political climate, what do you think the likelihood of success is for these kinds of calls for reparations? Well, if we're looking at the way that the Democrats are handling things thus far, I would say not so good. I don't mean to be doom and gloom, but the reality is, is that if the people who champion your causes aren't committed to helping you to the fullest extent of its power, then when you start talking about compromise and you start talking about negotiations, you're really starting from a disempowered position to begin with. So my attention is actually turned turn more towards corporate America and whether or not corporate America will step up and try to address some of these wrongs. Because unfortunately, for our elected officials right now, I see a lot of cowardness, but I don't see a lot of courage. As you know, we just marked uh, the more than a year since George Floyd's murder sparked protests in all 50 states. Do you think today that we're doing a better job of addressing the darker parts of our history, such as the Tulsa massacre? Um, I'm not quite sure if we're addressing it now. I mean, you just mentioned uh, the lawsuit. We heard about the testimony. This is still the information gathering stage. This is still assessing um, the damage that's been ignored. And this is just one massacre. There are tens and tens of similar massacres that have happened all over this country. So when you think about the extent of this conversation and where we are in simply trying to acknowledge this conversation, the idea that we're addressing the fallout um, is, 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 is nonsensical to me because we haven't even assessed the damage. And let's turn to the ABC News podcast, Life Out Loud with LZ Grandis. In the podcast, the first guest uh, was Stephen Canals, the co-creator of the FX show Pose. Let's take a listen. Stephen, there are so many lessons, beautiful lessons that you were sharing with us over these three seasons. And I'm just curious as to what was the one big lesson that you took away from this journey? That is a great question. You know, I think that one of the one of the lessons for sure that I've learned from working on this show is to stand unapologetically in my truth, to never dim my shine for anybody. I think for me, standing unapologetically in my truth means to allow Stephen to exist in all of his fullness, in all of his complexities, in all of his contradictions, because all of that is beautiful. And what did you make of his answer, especially at the start of this project? Uh, it was everything. It was absolutely everything. You know, particularly for queer people of color, this conversation regarding intersectionality has always been a messy one. Um, we want your contributions, but we don't want you to be too gay. We want you to be too gay, but we don't want you to be too black. Like, there's always seems to have been um, a willingness to accept one aspect of ourselves, uh, which usually causes us to quiet down or ignore another aspect of our being. And just hearing Stephen acknowledge that struggle and talk about overcoming that struggle, even again just now, um, really touches me because I myself, as a queer person of color, knows what it's like to try to juggle these different sort of aspects of my identity um, in a world that likes to be black and white and not have intersectionality be part of the conversation. Um, I'm also extremely proud of Stephen. I've told him that on the podcast, I've said that to him in private, because this is someone 
who took 166 no's, and he never stopped trying. He never stopped knocking on doors. He believed in this project. He believed in the stories of these characters. He believed in the importance of having trans women of color be showcased in this light. And because he believed in us so much as a community, he's now reaping the benefits. But it could not have been easy. So he embodies his statement of not letting his, his shine dim any, but he also inspires through his statement because he's living proof of what happens when you don't lower yourself so that others can feel taller. That persistence paying off there. And as we said earlier, you described the podcast as a letter to a host of people, including a younger version of yourself. You say uh, you used to deny who you were and that you used to bully others. What messages do you hope that young listeners in particular get from your podcast that perhaps you didn't hear growing up? Um, there, are, there are a lot of messages there. Um, the example that you gave in terms of bullying other queer people um, it's something that I'm embarrassed about, but I want it to be truthful because I want this podcast to be as transparent and as honest as possible. And I figured it was important that I began with myself. Um, I also wanted to let those other um, queer kids in school know that um, if you find yourself in this situation, there are other aspects to this larger conversation in terms of self-hate um, that is at play and to kind of be cognizant or aware of that. Um, but I also wanted um, this podcast and this letter, if you will, to both my younger self as well as the young people of today to, to let them know that, yes, things do get better. I'm living proof that it gets better. I remember applying for jobs in sports. I remember one of the hiring editors looking me in the eye, telling me that, I was a really good reporter and writer, but he couldn't send a faggot into the locker room during a job interview. Today, I work for the worldwide leader in sports. It was not easy. I'm not trying to pretend as if it was easy getting here. I'm not trying to pretend it's easy being here. But what I am saying is that I got here. So for any young person who is struggling right now with their gender identity or sexual orientation or some other aspect of their being. Keep being you, believe in the gifts that God is giving you, and know that if you stay the course, if you just believe in yourself long enough, things will get better. I am living proof of it. And, and also, I, I like that question that you begin your interviews with. You say, when did you remember something other than straight? Why did you decide that was going to be the, the recurring question? Um, because I thought it was a very good place to start for everyone, regardless of gender identity, regardless of sexual orientation. We all remember the first time we encountered someone who wasn't cisgender or who wasn't straight or we encountered an aspect of society that wasn't representative of a cisgender or heterosexual normative sort of lifestyle. We all remember. So I thought it was a great question to start because it kind of puts us all in the same level playing field. And usually the answer that I've gotten thus far through season one, 10 or younger, 10 years old or younger is the first time they were exposed or became aware of, which makes this push to red schools of LGBTQ history, absolutely ridiculous, considering that children in elementary school are cognizant of this element of society, and we have elected officials so afraid of people who are different that they're trying to pretend as if we aren't there, when the kids are smart enough to even see it. Elsie Granderson, always a pleasure to talk to you. You can listen to Life Out Loud on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you. Now to the fallout from Naomi Osaka's decision to withdraw from the French Open. The tennis superstar announcing that she's taking some time away from the court, opening up about her mental health struggles. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest. 
The number two ranked tennis player in the world was set to hit the clay court for her second round French Open match Wednesday. Instead, she'll be a no-show after suddenly dropping out. 23-year-old superstar Naomi Osaka tweeting, I think now the best thing for the tournament, the other players, and my well-being is that I withdraw. I never wanted to be a distraction. The decision just a day after Osaka was fined $15,000 for refusing to attend a post-match press conference instead agreeing to this brief courtside interview. I'm really glad that I won and um, it's a very beautiful court. We are sorry and sad for Naomi Osaka. We remain very committed to all athletes' well-being. Osaka says she's battled long bouts of depression and anxiety since springing into stardom in 2018 when she beat Serena Williams at the U.S. Open, standing emotional under a towel as Williams fans booed her win. Williams speaking out Monday, supporting Osaka. I feel for Naomi because I know what it's like. You just have to let her handle it the way she wants to. Osaka has spoken about her mental health struggles in the past, opening up about her depression after losing a 2018 match in Charleston. Like yesterday, I just woke up and I was really depressed, but I don't know why. Like, I'm so sad right now. I, uh... The press is very instrumental. Uh, in the growth of the game. At the same time, I think it's time to take a, a closer look at the structure of these press conferences. Our thanks to Rena. And still to come, China reports the first human case of a new bird fly strain, what they're saying about the risk of infection. And the three brothers who ser served in Afghanistan, only one made it out alive, but the story he tells of service is as heartbreaking as it is inspirational. It was Gone Girl. Oh my God, the Hollywood story come true. She was kidnapped, held captive. I thought it was the end of my life. He was tied up, left to think the love of his life was dead. I was afraid that was gonna be like the last time I was gonna see her. And just when you thought this true crime couldn't get any more shocking. All of a sudden, boom, this is insane. Now, the stunning all new interview. All I wanted was to hug my mom and dad. Finally feel safe. 2020, Friday night on ABC. powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. It was Gone Girl. Oh my God, the Hollywood story come true. She was kidnapped, held captive. I thought it was the end of my life. He was tied up, left to think the love of his life was dead. I was afraid that was gonna be like the last time I was gonna see her. And just when you thought this true crime couldn't get any more shocking. All of a sudden, boom, this is insane. Now, the stunning all new interview. All I wanted was to hug my mom and dad. 
finally feel safe. 2020, Friday night on ABC. There's a sense of pride when I look at the black families that were in towns like Tulsa. The white population burned the whole town down. A hundred years ago, there were race riots and massacres across the country. In telling the story of what happened, we can understand what we have come through. This idea that we will make America what it was, no, no, no. We will make America what she should be. Matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Take a look at this mesmerizing video of volcano in Iceland. The long dormant volcano has been attracting thrill seekers like the man who filmed it since it erupted back in March. This is the first video we recall that shows a drone purposefully flying straight into the volcano and being incinerated. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. The WHO is now calling the virus variant from Vietnam the Delta variant. Vietnam was seen as a model of success containing the virus, but has subsequently experienced a sharp increase in cases in recent weeks. It's unclear if the Delta variant is to blame. Meanwhile, we're now learning in South America that Peru's COVID death toll is the worst in the world per capita. That nation is taking a look at its deaths. It's now believed more than one 180,000 have died from COVID. Pope Francis has changed Catholic law to now criminalize the sexual abuse of adults by priests. The law recognizes that adults as well as children can be victimized by priests who abuse their power. The rules which go into effect in December also say that people holding church positions like school principals can also be punished for abuse. China is reporting its first human case of H10N3 bird flu. Authorities there say a man in eastern China can contracted what could be the first human case of the strain. He was hospitalized in late April and is said to be in stable condition. Chinese officials claim the infection happened due to an accidental cross-species uh, transmission and that the large risk of scale transmission is low. The 41-year-old man who became sick is the only reported case so far. And finally tonight, for many, this past Memorial Day weekend was about reconnecting while honoring the brave men and women who have sacrificed everything for our country. In Arkansas, the Wise family had three sons serving in Afghanistan in the years after 9-11, but two of those brothers lost their lives there. The youngest, Bo Wise, was pulled from the battlefield and designated as a sole survivor. He tells his family's heartbreaking story in his memoir, Three Wise Men. And our Martha Raddatz sat down with Bo Wise and brings us this remarkable story of service and sacrifice. What was it like growing up a wise boy? Um, I was kind of constantly getting pulled into various different shenanigans of variety, mostly instigated by Jeremy. It was Jeremy, the oldest, who led the pack of wise siblings, telling brothers Ben and Bo, we'll always have each other. No matter what happens, you'll always have two brothers to lean on. But 9-11 would change everything. We just got a report in that there's been some sort of explosion at the World Trade Center in New York City. All three of the wise boys eventually deploying to Afghanistan in what would become America's longest war. Bo, a Marine, Ben, a Green Beret, Jeremy, a Navy SEAL, and later a CIA contractor. Bo's brothers serving eight combat deployments combined, both becoming husbands and fathers, snatching precious moments at home with loved ones. Happy birthday to you. But always returning to the next tour. They both saw a lot of action. They saw a lot, but I think Ben might have seen uh, probably the most. Bo worried about Ben, but not so much about Jeremy. From the beginning, I, I wasn't really worried about him. I mean, it was just, he, he was invincible, you know, in my mind. Invincible in the way only an older brother can be, but not against a suicide bomber. 
We turn now to the other major story this evening, Afghanistan, where a grim portrait is emerging tonight. Jeremy was among seven CIA employees or contractors killed in coast Afghanistan, the deadliest attack on the CIA in more than 25 years. Bo was in Helmand province at the time. Tell me about the day that Jeremy died. Immediately, my first response was absolute anger. I, I, I really wanted to just, you know. Um, and then I just, the shock came over and it was just numb uh, for a while. And Bo and Ben would return for Jeremy's funeral. Ben telling Bo, I can't believe I'm the oldest brother now. But soon, Bo would be the oldest. Some two years later in 2012, with Ben and Bo both in Afghanistan, the Wise family would suffer another shattering loss. He took eight to 10 rounds that traveled south to north through his uh, chest, legs, and groin. And he was a fighter, and he, he fought for six days. And they eventually lifted him to Landstuhl uh, Hospital in Germany. And um, after six days, um, he eventually succumbed to his wounds. Bo served as what's called a guardian angel among those who escorted his brother's body back home. Bo with the realization he was now a sole survivor, one of the only ones with that designation since World War II. The commandant told you that night, told your parents that night, you would not be put in harm's way. I didn't take that news very well um, at the time. I, I do now. Co-author Tom Soleo documenting these harrowing years in three wise men. Every single day, every single day is Memorial Day for them. So when we say sole survivor, um, you know, I think it's not just about the, the term itself, it's about the person and the people who have to live with what happened because of those ultimate sacrifices. Jeremy's CIA service is now commemorated with a star on the CIA memorial wall. Bo, unable to attend the memorial service in 2010, saw that star for the first time this week. Still emotional, hours later. CIA Director Bill Burns honoring Jeremy as well. You talked to his brother today. I did, which was a privilege because, you know, Jeremy Wise, as you well know, is a remarkable patriot, uh, a Navy SEAL before he came to CIA, uh, in a family of remarkable patriots. The weight of that wall ever present. This memorial wall is hallowed ground for CIA. It now holds 137 stars, each one marking a CIA officer who was killed in the line of duty. CIA officers um, go to places that others can't go, to hard places around the world to collect information, to disrupt adversaries, to fight terrorists. And so almost by definition, what we do at CIA is rarely seen. It's often not well understood. People take enormous risks here. And those risks are very real. Um, and the sacrifices that they and their families make are very real as well. That sacrifice certainly real. Our thanks to Martha Raditz. And of course, we honor the service of the Wise family and all of our other service members. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. It was Gone Girl. Oh my God, the Hollywood story.